Is everybody happy to be here this morning? Amen. Amen. I'm excited. Um, I'm excited because of what the Lord has given me to say. And um, because it has potential. It has potential to make a great impact to each person in this place individually on a personal level, but also um, collectively as a body, as a unit, a functioning unit, um, as a church. So that to me is exciting. So the foundational text that I want to use from the scripture is James 5.16. And, and I feel like pretty sure that we're all familiar with that verse, um, which says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And it ends saying, uh, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I see it happening in the body, in myself and in others, but not to the degree that I think the Lord intends for it. Sometimes I think when we go through struggles, uh, we hide it. And sometimes there's a, there's a time and a place. There's a time and a place, right, not to share certain things that you may be going through. But we're not taking advantage of a system that God put in place. This is something that comes with a promise. Do this and this will happen. So I wonder if sometimes maybe some of the things um, we're not healed of, and I'm not just talking about maybe physical ailments, but I'm talking about emotional stuff. And, and that's something I've struggled with my whole life, different emotional issues. And so I think what happens is we, we, we tend to hide that kind of stuff though, right? Like, like well, someone, they're going to judge me, you might think, or they won't understand, or they're going to think less of me if I tell them this, or we're embarrassed. What about um, stuff, and I'm talking about heart matters, so what about stuff like bitterness or resentment or anger? I want to tell you that nobody has, hasn't come up to me, and I'm not saying this is a thing, maybe they've come up to you or maybe they haven't, but I've not had anybody come up to me and say, you know what, I'm struggling with bitterness, and here's why, and I know what the Word of God says, and I've been praying, and I've been crying, and I've been saying, God, help me, and I can't overcome it. Can I talk to you? Can we sit down and pray together? Will you pray with me? Will you talk? I don't see that happening. What, what do you say? Well, maybe nobody's bitter. Well, maybe not. But are they not bitter, angry, envious, covetous? None of it, really? I mean, the Word of God says that's the nature of the flesh. And yet we, we, we feel like embarrassed, like as if no one else had felt such a thing. I do. I'm like, oh my gosh, nobody else has felt this but me. Like, do you realize actually how silly that is, though? If you think about it, if, if we are vessels of clay and we are in a body of flesh and the Word of God says that the sin is in the flesh, so that means it happens within all of us. Maybe some are more prone to one thing or another, but do we not have understanding? That would be like me saying, well, I go to sleep every night and I can't tell anybody about it, not realizing that everybody else's body has to sleep too. So just to make that comparison of whatever things we struggle with inside of us that we're afraid, ashamed to share with somebody, other people are going through it too. Maybe it's a different area or maybe it's the exact same thing. It just depends. Um, but we don't. We're embarrassed and ashamed. And then the other thing, the other barrier that I see to James 5.16 is sometimes consider this situation. Maybe there's an offense. You've got in a relationship over here, friendship. Uh, it could be it could be any relationship you have, and you say something's amiss here. I think I might have hurt this person, but I'm not sure. So first thing you do is right. You, you evaluate. You talk to the Holy Spirit. You're like Lord, and you you evaluate. You're like, have I maybe I said something and I wasn't thinking and I've hurt them, or maybe. Um, maybe I did something, or maybe they wanted me to, and I, I didn't pick up the cue, and, and there, and I've disappointed them. You know, all these sorts of things that could be wrong, but whatever is the case, you evaluate, and you still don't know. But you love the person, so you're like, I, I, I'm just going to go up and say, hey, because I want it to be okay again, and, and if I did something, then I want to make it right. So you go up to them, and you say, hey, I'm feeling kind of weird, and I just, have I done something? Did I hurt you? 
Do you know what I find most often people to say? No. No, you didn't do anything. And that's good. That's good if that's true. But what if you did and they of themselves are like, well, I don't want to be petty or, or whatever is the case. Maybe they don't feel like they can. Maybe they feel like, well, if I tell you, you're going to get angry at me or whatever is the case. But they don't tell you. So then what happens is the person who asked walks away going, okay, well, what else can I do? And so they have, there's nothing that can be done. And then that person who's hurt and wouldn't say so remains hurt by themselves. When God intended for us, sometimes we avoid conflict. Now, I, I do, I, y'all, I avoid conflict, but not so much so that I'm not willing to, uh, you know, do what you got to do sometimes. I don't want to fight. I don't want to argue. But sometimes you have to do the hard stuff to get to something better. And, and just what comes to mind right now is when Jacob wrestled with God. The very name Israel means one who fights with God. So the what I do with people that I love, I fight with them. Not all the time. But sometimes you have to. And it's not because you want to have a bad time or hurt them or have them hurt you. But sometimes, because what's on the other side of that conflict is a greater relationship, a greater intimacy, oneness, closeness, understanding of one another. And I want that. And I'm willing to push past any conflict to get to it. So... And that's just one example. But um, for me, I want to confess a couple of my faults to you all this morning. And what led me to uh, what I'm going to share here. One of my weaknesses is that I have a hard time to tell people no. Not all the time, I can say no, but oftentimes I say yes when I should say no. Um, And in fact, my desire to please God and the fact that I love Him and I do love people and I love helping, like there's inner fulfillment to me to help somebody, like let my life be worth something, let it count, like that internally is rewarding to me just to be helpful. So because of that, If somebody comes to ask me for help, I'm going to try to help them. And God showed me that sometimes I need to say no. And this was overwhelming to me to the point of tears where I'm like, well, God, I don't know when to say no. I don't know how to say no. Is it okay to say no? Am I a Christian, a good one? We already discussed that in the past. That there's no such thing as a good Christian. But I'm saying, can you, can I still say I want to love the Lord and serve Him if I say no? These were real questions for me. And not just the questions, but coming to the conclusions of them, then how do I go about it? I don't know how to say no because that feels mean to me. If you need my help, that feels mean to me to say no. I cannot help you. But that's not biblical. God does call us to serve and love one another. But I have to take care of other things too, like myself, my own responsibilities. I cannot overcommit and help. Because then what it happens is I begin to please everyone else instead of God. So this was a little bit emotional for me, more so because I didn't know how to change it. So I, I prayed. I'm like, Lord, you've got to help me. I don't know. Um, so I prayed, I did a little research and he led me to a book. So I'm going to read a portion of this book and I was a little nervous about it because it's going to take me just a few extra minutes to do that, to read this account from this book. But God assured me with much wrestling that he wanted me to read it. And I said, Lord, I, I, you know, lean into my own understanding. I'm like, Lord, I don't think they want to hear all that. I don't think they want to listen. I that's a long time. They want to come in. They want to go on their merry way. And I, so what I did was, right, I was like, well, so here's what I'll do. I'll try to condense it, make it smaller for everybody. And I tried. And uh, the Holy Spirit kept saying, I want all of it. So I don't know if this could be for anybody here. I don't know who it's for, but it was definitely every bit of it for me. But just like our God does, 
when you pray and he provides a solution, he gives much more than you bargained for. Because this is the book that he led me to. It's called Boundaries. And on the front it says, when to say yes, how to say no, to take back control of your life. And on the back it, it mentions some, some questions that people have. Can I still be a good person? Am I loving if I say no? And so it has some of that. And it's just to let you know, it is biblically based. It is widely used in pastoral counseling. Two psychologists, Christian men, who minister biblically um, have written the book. And so even when I first got the book, I'm like, okay, uh, this is the solution God led me to. I wonder if this is it, though. I wasn't quite sure. I'm like, boundaries? Okay, all right. I mean, is that, is this going to help? I didn't know. So the very first thing I want to do is I want to read you and you don't realize, too, you don't realize how widespread it is. Like, you start thinking, okay, well, maybe I have a hard time to say no. And maybe some of you are sitting here going, well, that's not my problem at all. I say no right well. But what I discovered was that there's different issues of boundary problems that don't manifest themselves as you not saying no. There's other issues. And, and what I saw was every person I know in this book, their behavior patterns and the way that they act toward one another and how we interact with one another. And I'm not saying that like in an accusatory way. I'm saying we are broken people and we have some broken ways of doing things sometimes. And sometimes it's only because we don't know another way. Sometimes we, we recognize it and we just don't know how to change it or what to do. But sometimes we just don't even recognize it, right? That was the case for me when I was like, if somebody was to call me a people pleaser before... Before God revealed that in some cases I'm doing that, you see the old redneck in me rise like, what? <laughs> like, I don't, because I don't. I don't feel like I do. I do not live my life for everyone else. I often think, well, I can't make everybody happy. But what was actually happening, even though I had thought that, was that I would do it sometimes. So in case you're thinking, well, I don't know if this applies to me, I'm just going to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the account of this woman. It, it is a one-day account. It basically just runs you through her day and tells you what her life is like. And it's called A Day in a Boundaryless Life. So this is what life is like for her, just one day in a life with no boundaries. And what I'd like for you to do is to try and stay focused on what is being said, and see if you can find yourself in this story. There's going to be different characters in the story with different, manifesting different character patterns, different habits and behaviors of, of being in relationships. And I want you to see if you can find yourself, but then also the Holy Spirit might start revealing other people around you like, hey, my, I don't know, my brother does this, my sister does that, my mom does this, or, and, and it gives insight. And so I want to encourage everybody first to go get this book later. It's only $15, but um, I, I believe in it that much. But what I want to do is, if you would, just try to find yourself in the story. And no condemnation. And one other thing, don't fall into a stereotype. Like if you see a husband in the story acting a certain way, that doesn't mean that all husbands are going to be manifesting that particular pattern. And if you see the wife like, well, these are her particular weaknesses, that doesn't mean that the, all the wives are going to be like, these are interchangeable. So keep that in mind. 6 a.m. The alarm jangled. Blurry-eyed from too little sleep, Sherry shut off the noisy intruder. She turned on the bedside lamp and sat up in bed. Looking blankly at the wall, she tried to get her bearings. Why am I dreading this day, Lord? Didn't you promise me a life of joy? This is first thing in the morning. Then as the cobwebs left her mind, Sherry remembered the reason for her dread. That 4.30 meeting with her son's teacher. His third grade teacher had called and that, that the phone call, the memory of the phone call returned to her mind. Sherry, this is Jean Russell. I wonder if we could talk about Todd's performance and his behavior. Todd couldn't see, keep still, and he couldn't listen to his teachers. He didn't even listen to Sherry and Walt, truth be told. 
Todd was such a strong-willed child, and she didn't want to quench his spirit. That was more important after all, wasn't it? Well, no time to worry about all of that, Sherry said to herself, raising her 35-year-old body off the bed and padding off to the shower. I've got enough troubles to keep me busy all day. Under the shower, her mind moved out of first gear. She began mentally ticking off the day's schedule. Todd, who was nine years old, her son, and Amy, who was six years old, her daughter, would have been a handful, even if she wasn't a working parent. Let's see, she said. I've got to fix breakfast, pack two lunches, Amy's costume for the school play, that will be the trick, finishing that costume before her carpool picks her up in about an hour. Sherry regretfully thought about last night. She planned to work on Amy's costume then, using her talents to make a special day for her little girl. But her mother had dropped over unexpectedly. Good manners dictated that she play hostess. She cringed inwardly as her mom stopped in. Mom, you can't imagine how much I enjoy your surprise visits, but, uh, you know, would you mind if I work on this costume while we talk? And she cringed, waiting correctly for her mother's response. Now, Sherry, you know I wouldn't want to intrude on your family time. Sherry's mother, who had been widowed for 12 years, had elevated her widowhood to the status of martyrdom. I mean, since your father died, it's been such an empty time. I still miss our family. How could I deprive you of that of yourself? I bet I'm about to find out, Sherry thought. That's why I can understand why you and Walt don't bring the children to see me anymore. How could I be entertaining? I'm just a lonely old lady who gave her entire life to her children who would want to spend time with me? No, Mom, no. No, I mean, really, see, Mom, what, what I'm trying to say is, and Sherry quickly joins this little emotional drama that she and her mom have been carrying out for decades. That's not what I meant at all. You see, what I mean is, it's so special having you over and, and, and goodness knows with our schedule, we want to come by more. We do, but we just haven't been able to. But see, that's why I'm glad that you took the initiative. Forgive me, Lord, for this little lie, she thought. In fact, I can sew this costume any old time. Lord, forgive me for this lie too. Now, why don't I make us some coffee? So the visit lasted well into the night. By the time her mother left, Sherry felt absolutely crazy, but she justified it to herself. She said, well, at least I've helped make her lonely day a little brighter. Then a pesky voice piped up and said, if you helped so much, why was she still talking about her loneliness when she left? Trying to ignore that thought, Sherry went to bed. Now here we are, returning to the present, 6.45 a.m. She's been awake for 45 minutes now. Sherry returned to the present. No use crying over spilt time, she mumbled to herself as she struggled to close the zipper of her black linen skirt. Her favorite suit had become, as many others had, too tight. Middle-aged spread so soon, she thought. I have got to start exercising and dieting this week, she said. The next hour was, as usual, a disaster. The kids whined about getting out of bed, and Walt, her husband, complained. Why does it take so long to get the kids to the table? 7.45 a.m. Miraculously, the kids made it to their rides. Walt, her husband, left for work, and Sherry went out and locked the front door after her. Taking a deep breath, she prayed silently. Lord, I am not looking forward to this day. Can you please give me something to hope for? In her car, she finished applying her makeup at the traffic stops. Thank the Lord for long red lights. 8.45 a.m. Rushing into McAllister Enterprises, where she worked as a human resources director... Sherry glanced at her watch. 
only a few minutes late. Maybe by now, her colleagues are starting to understand that this is a way of life for her. And maybe finally, they don't even expect her to be on time. She was wrong. They had started the weekly meeting without her. She tried to tiptoe in unnoticed and slip into her seat, but every eye was on her. Glancing around, she gave a fleeting smile and muttered something about that crazy traffic. 11.59 a.m., just before lunch. The rest of her morning had proceeded fairly well. A gifted advocate and problem solver, Sherry was loved by the staff that she served. And she was a valuable asset to McAllister Enterprises. The only hitch came just before lunch. Her desk phone rang. She answers, Sherry Phillips. Oh, Sherry, thank goodness you're there. I don't know what I would have done if you had been to lunch. There was no mistaking this voice. Sherry had known Lois Thompson since grade school, and Lois, well, she was thin-skinned, perpetually anxious, and always in crisis. Sherry tried to make herself available to Lois to be there for her. But Lois never reciprocated. When Sherry occasionally mentioned her own struggles, Lois either changed the subject back to herself or she found some reason to leave. Sherry genuinely loved Lois, and she was concerned about her and her problems, but she also resented the imbalance in their friendship. As always, Sherry felt guilty when she thought about her anger at Lois. As a Christian, she knew the value that the Bible placed on loving and helping others. There I go again, Lord. She would say to herself, thinking of myself before others. Please, Lord, help me to give to Lois freely and not be so self-centered. Sherry asked, what's the matter, Lois? Oh, it's horrible, just horrible, she said. Anne was sent home from school today. Tom was denied his promotion at work. And, well, my car gave out on the freeway. Sherry thought, this is my life every day, feeling that resentment rising up. However, she merely said, Lois, you poor thing, how are you coping? <clears throat> Lois was happy to answer Sherry's question in great detail. So much detail that Sherry missed half her lunch, consoling her friend. Sitting in the drive through thinking fast food is better than no food, she was waiting for her lunch. She was thinking to herself about Lois and said, if all my listening, consoling, and advice had made any difference over the years, maybe it would be worth it. But Lois still makes the same mistakes now that she made 20 years ago. Why do I do this to myself? 4 p.m. The day's almost over, at least the work day. 4 p.m. Sherry's afternoon passed uneventfully. She was on the way out of the office to that teacher's meeting that she had been dreading all day when her boss, Jeff Moreland, flagged her down. Glad I caught up with you, Sherry, he said. He was a successful figure at McAllister Enterprises. Jeff made things happen. Trouble was, Jeff often used other people to make things happen. And so Sherry could sense the hundredth verse of the same old song tuning up again. Uh, listen, I'm in a time crunch, he says. And I just emailed you a draft of my presentation for next week's board meeting. All it needs is a little rewriting and some editing. And I need to distribute it to the executive team tomorrow for a preliminary review. But I'm sure a quick turnaround would be no problem for you. Here we are at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This is 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and now he's giving her a report that he wants her to do. That's her boss. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Sherry panicked. Jeff's editing needs were legendary. Sherry anticipated a minimum of five hours of work. I gave him all the data that he needed for that report and presentation three weeks ago. And she felt the furiousness rising within her. And she said, where does this man get off having me save his face over his deadline? 
but quickly she composed herself. Sure, Jeff, that's no problem. I'm glad that I can help. What time did you need it? Nine o'clock in the morning would be fine. And thanks, Sherry. I always think of you first when I'm in a jam. You're so dependable. Jeff strolled away. He strolled. Sherry thought, dependable? Faithful? Reliable? I've always been described this way by people who want something from me. Sounds like a description of a good mule. But suddenly the guilt hit again. There I go getting resentful again. Lord, please help me to bloom where I'm planted. But secretly, she found herself wishing that she would be transplanted into another flower pot. 4.30 p.m., parent-teacher conference. Jean Russell was a competent teacher one of many in the profession who understood the complex factors beneath the child's problem behavior. The meeting with Todd's teacher began as so many before, minus her husband won't. Todd's father hadn't been able to get off work, so the two women talked alone. He's not a bad child, Sherry, Mrs. Russell reassured her. Todd is a bright and energetic boy. When he minds, he is one of the most enjoyable kids in the class. Sherry waited for the axe to fall. Just get to the point, she thought. I have a problem kid, right? I got a problem life to go with it, she thought. Sensing Sherry's discomfort, Mrs. Russell continued. She pressed forward. The problem is that Todd doesn't respond well to limits. For example, in our task period, When the children work on their individual assignments, Todd has great difficulty. He gets up from his desk, he pesters other kids, and he won't stop talking. And when I mention it to him that his behavior is inappropriate, he becomes enraged and obstinate. Sherry felt defensive about her only son. Well, I mean, maybe Todd is is, is attention deficit or or, or hyperactive. Uh, It could be that. Miss Russell shook her head. No. When Todd's second grade teacher last year had thought that, the psychological testing outruled it. Todd stays on task very well when he's interested in the subject. I'm no therapist, but it seems to me that he's just not used to responding to rules. Now Sherry's defensive turned to herself. Are you suggesting this is some sort of home problem? Miss Russell looked uncomfortable. As I said, uh, I'm no therapist. I just know that in third grade, most children resist rules. But Todd is off the scale. Anytime I tell him to do something he doesn't want to do, it's World War III. And since all his intellectual and cognitive testings came out normal... I was just wondering how things were at home. Sherry no longer tried to hold back the tears. She buried her hands and wept, feeling overwhelmed and everything. Eventually, her crying subsided. I'm sorry. I guess I just, this is, it's just a bad day for me. And she rummaged in her purse for a tissue. No, no, it's more than that, Jean. I'm sorry, I have to be honest with you. Your problems with him are the same as mine. Walt and I have a real struggle making Todd mind at home. When we're playing or talking, Todd is the most wonderful son I could imagine. But anytime I have to discipline him, the tantrums are more than I can handle. So I guess I don't have any solutions for you. Jean, the teacher, nodded her head slowly. This really helps me, Sherry. It helps to know that his behavior is a problem at home also because at least now we can put our heads together and find a solution. 5.15 p.m. Sherry felt strangely grateful for the afternoon rush hour traffic. At least there's no one tugging on me here, she thought. She used the time to plan around her next crisis, which would be kids, dinner, and that report for her boss and Walt her husband. 6.30 p.m. For the fourth and last time, dinner is ready, she shouted. She hated to scream, but what else worked? 
The kids and Walt always seemed to shuffle in whenever they felt like it. More often than not, dinner was cold by the time everyone else showed up. Sherry had no clue what the problem was. She knew it wasn't the food because she was a good cook. And besides, once they got to the table, everyone inhaled it in seconds. Everyone but Amy, her daughter. Watching her six-year-old daughter sit silently picking distractedly at her food, Sherry again felt uneasy. Amy was such a lovable and sensitive child. Why was she so reserved? Amy had never been outgoing. She preferred to spend her time reading, painting, or just sitting in her room thinking about stuff, she would say. What stuff, Sherry would ask. Just stuff, she would say. Sherry felt shut out of her daughter's life. She dreamed of mother-daughter talks, conversations for just the girls, and shopping trips. But Amy had a secret place deep inside that no one was ever invited to. The unreachable part of her heart, Sherry longed to touch. 7 p.m. Halfway through dinner, Sherry's cell phone rang. I'm just going to get let it go to voicemail, she said. There's precious little time for us to be together as a family anymore. Then, as if on cue, another familiar thought struck her mind. What if it's someone who needs me? So as always, Sherry listened to the second voice in her head and jumped up from the table, left her family to answer the phone. Her heart sank when she saw the name on the caller ID. Well, I'm already up from the table, she thought. I may as well just get it over with. So she answers, hello? Hope I'm not disturbing anything, said Phyllis Renfro, the women's ministry leader at church. Oh, certainly you're not disturbing anything, Sherry lied. Sherry, I'm in deep water. Margie was, doing our, was going to be our activities coordinator at the retreat, and now she's canceled. Something about priorities at home or something, but can you fill in? The retreat. Sherry had almost forgotten that the annual women's retreat was this weekend, and she had actually been looking forward to leaving the kids and Walt and just strolling around the beautiful mountainous area for two days, just herself and the Lord. In fact, the possibility of solitude felt better than the planned group activities. Taking on Margie's activities coordinator position would mean giving up her precious alone time. No, it wouldn't work. Sherry would just have to say, but automatically, that second thought pattern intervened. What a privilege to serve God and these women. Sherry, by giving up just a little portion of yourself and your time, letting go of your selfishness, You can make a big difference in some lives. Think it over. She didn't have to think it over. Sherry had learned to respond unquestioningly to this familiar voice just as she responded to her mother's and Phyllis's and maybe God's too. Whoever it belonged to, this voice was too strong to be ignored. Habit won out. I'll be happy to help. Sherry told Phyllis, just send me whatever Margie's done and I'll get working on it. Phyllis sighed, audibly relieved. Sherry, I know it's a sacrifice. Myself, I have to do it several times every day, being living sacrifices. If you say so, Sherry thought, but she couldn't help wondering when the abundant part would come in of the abundant life. 7.45 p.m., Dinner finally finished, Sherry watched Walt position himself in front of the TV for the football game. Todd, her son, picked up his Xbox and headed and his headphones and headed off to disappear into his video game, while Amy, her daughter, slipped quietly into her room. The dishes stayed on the table. The family hadn't quite got the hang of helping clean up yet. But maybe the kids were still a little young for that. Sherry cleared the dishes from the table on her own. 11.30 p.m., Years ago, Sherry could have cleaned up after dinner, gotten the kids to bed on time, and finished editing Jeff's report with ease. A cup of coffee after dinner and the adrenaline rush that accompanied crisis and deadlines galvanized Sherry into superhuman feats of productivity. She wasn't called Super Sherry for nothing. 
but it was becoming noticeably harder these days. Stress didn't work like it used to. More and more, she was having trouble concentrating. She was forgetting deadlines and dates and not even caring a great deal about it. At any rate, by sheer willpower, she had completed most of her tasks. Maybe her edits on Jeff report had suffered just a bit in quality, but she felt too resentful to feel too bad. But then she felt guilty again. But I did say yes to Jeff, she thought. It's not his fault, it's mine. Why couldn't I tell him how unfair it was for him to lay this on me? No time for that now. She had to get on with her real task for the evening. Her talk with Walt, her husband. Her and Walt's courtship and early marriage had been pleasant. They were in love and they were good partners. Where she had been uncertain, he had been decisive. Where he had been pessimistic, she had been hopeful. When she noticed Walt's lack of emotional connectedness, she naturally took it upon herself to try and provide the warmth and the love that that relationship lacked. God has put together a good team, she would tell herself. We both bring strengths to our marriage, and Walt has a lot of wisdom, and I have a lot of love. This would help her get over those lonely times when he just couldn't seem to understand her hurt feelings. But over the years... Sherry noticed a shift in the relationship. It started off subtly and then became more pronounced. She could hear it in his sarcastic tone when she made a complaint. She saw it in the lack of respect in his eyes when she tried to tell him about her need for more support from him. She felt it in his increasingly insistent demands for her to do things his way. And his temper, maybe it was job stress or having kids, whatever it was, Sherry never dreamed she'd ever hear the cutting, angry words that she heard from the lips of the man she'd married. She didn't have to cross him much at all to be subjected to his anger. Clutter on the counter, a checking overdraft, or forgetting to gas up the car, any of these seemed to be enough. And at first she thought she was imagining things. There I go again. Looking for trouble when I have a great life. That would help for a while until Walt's next temper attack. Then her hurt and sadness would tell her the truth that her mind wasn't willing to accept. Finally realizing that Walt was a controlling person, Sherry took the blame upon herself. I'd be that way too if I had a basket case like me to live with. I'm the reason he gets so critical and frustrated. These conclusions led Sherry to a solution that she had been practicing for years, and it's called loving Walt out of his anger. And this is how it went. She learned to read Walt well. It was a strategy that went something like this. First, she learned to read his emotions by watching his temper, body language, and tone of voice. She became exquisitely aware of his moods and especially sensitive to the things that could set him off. Lateness, disagreements, her own anger, and as long as she was quiet and agreeable, there was no problem. But let her own preferences raise their head and she risked getting her head lopped off. Sherry had learned to read him so well and quickly that after sensing she was crossing an emotional line, she would employ stage two of loving Walt, where she would do an immediate backtrack, coming around to his viewpoint, but not really, but quietly holding her tongue or even apologizing for being hard to live with. These all seemed to work well. Stage three of loving Walt was doing special things for him just to show that she was sincere. This might mean dressing more attractively or making his favorite meals. Didn't the Bible talk about this being this kind of wife? So the three steps of loving walk worked for a time, but the peace never lasted. The problem with loving Walt out of his anger 
was that Sherry was dead tired of trying to soothe him out of his tantrums. Thus, he stayed angry longer, and his anger isolated her more from him. Her love for her husband was eroding. She had felt that no matter how bad things were, God joined them together and that their love would get them through. But in the past few years, it was more commitment than love. And when she was honest, she admitted that the time she could feel nothing at all toward Walt except fear and resentment. And that's what tonight was all about. Things needed to change. Somehow they needed to rekindle the flames of their first love. So she walked into the family room. The late night talk show host on the television screen had just finished his monologue. She spoke softly. Honey, can we talk? She asked tentatively. There was no answer. Moving closer, she saw why. Walt had fallen asleep on the couch. Thinking about waking Walt up, she remembered his stinging words the last time that she had been so insensitive. She turned off the television and lights and walked to the empty bedroom. 11.50 p.m. This is the last entry for her day. 11.50 p.m. Lying in bed, Sherry couldn't tell which was greater, her loneliness or her exhaustion. Deciding it was the first, she picked up her Bible from the bedside table and opened it to the New Testament. Give me something to hope for, Lord. Please, she prayed silently. Her eyes fell to the words of Christ in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. But Lord, I already feel like that, she protested. I feel poor in spirit. I mourn over my life, my marriage, my children. I try to be gentle, but I just feel run over all the time. Where is your promise? Where is your hope? Where are you? She waited in the darkened room for an answer. None came. The only sound was the quiet pit pat of tears running off her cheeks. So, as I said before I read that account of her day, that is the account of a woman who has no boundaries. And as you can see the different patterns, we're not looking to point fingers at anybody and go, well, this one did that and this... Let's just instead look and say, okay, let's see the problem areas and fix them. Um, but as I, when, I, when I read that, I had to put the, the book down. That, that's chapter one. I had to take a couple days to process just that and to figure out what all that meant for me. Because I saw those patterns that I was manifesting and that I don't know how to change. But I couldn't go any further. So I put the book down for a few days, two or three, before I could resume and read more. When I picked the book back up and continued to read, the one thing that I didn't anticipate to learn was the other people in the story, right, who had boundary issues too. And those aren't quite as obvious, or at least they weren't to me. But I just want to run over really quick what God showed me. Four types of boundary issue people, if you want to call it that, and I see it everywhere. Like each relationship I have, I'm like, what do I see? And it's not to accuse, right? It's to say, hey, what's going on here? Because I want it to be better Every, everywhere. All my relationships, I want, I want greater intimacy, oneness, closeness. Um, so I'm willing to look. Now you can't change other people. But let me just quickly, and you see if you hear or no, if you are doing this or someone in your, one of your relationships is doing this, but there is one, the person who can't say no. They are called the compliant person. Basically, this person can't say no, and in, when they do say no, they feel guilty, right? And it, it's for the reasons I described already. You feel like, but I love the Lord, and I love people, and somebody needs my help, and it's fulfilling to me when I help and be used, and 
So then you do it. And there's nothing wrong with doing that, but you can't do it always, all the time, consistently, because then you're going you're gonna to not take care of something that needs taken care of. It might be, just be you. Um, and also this, they tend to realize too late that they are in a bad situation or an abusive relationship. That's true for me. And if you, <laughs> this is exposing me, but do you know somebody who's, who can't say no? Do you know that that's rooted in fear? Fear. Now, it might be a number of fears. It could be fear of abandonment, fear of someone else's anger, fear of rejection. Um, it could be a lot of different things. The book lists some of them. But the person who can't say no, that's rooted in fear. And the other thing that's characteristic of that person, they take on too many responsibilities and they set too few boundaries. Now, there is a second person. So we got the compliant person who just will say yes to everything or most. Then we got the person who, we got the person who can't say no. Now we got the person who can't hear no. Now this person is the controller. Now here's how the controller is. The controller aggressively or manipulatively violates the boundaries of others. They can't respect the limits of others. They see your no as a challenge to change your mind. They also are isolated and undisciplined, which surprised me. I'm like, man, they're so busy trying to control everything. They probably got a tight ship in their own, but they don't. In fact, what I learned was that they resist taking responsibility for their own life, so that's why they need to control others. What? And the only reason I'm pausing there is because I feel like I've had a lot of controllers in my life. So I need to see what am I doing and what am I not doing and what can I change. Now there's another person. There's the person who can't say no the compliant, the person who can't hear no, the controller. Now we've got the person who can't say yes. What does that look like? The person who cannot say yes. What this means is when you have a need and you come to them, they can't say yes. I'll, I'll talk with you. I'll sit with you. I'll help you in this way. They set boundaries against responsibility to love. And what does it look like? I just want to read a brief if you will give me one minute, this one won't take long. This is an account. Brenda's hand trembled as she talked. Usually I've got pretty thick skin with Mike, but I guess the past couple of weeks of kid problems and work stresses had me feeling vulnerable. This time his response didn't make me angry, it just hurt. And it hurt bad. Brenda was recounting a recent marital struggle, and after all, overall, she thought her marriage to Mike was a good one. He was a good provider, an active Christian, and a competent father. Yet the relationship allowed no room for her hurts and her needs. The incident that Brenda was discussing began in a fairly benign manner. She and Mike were talking in the bedroom after putting the kids to bed. And Brenda began to unburden her fears to her husband about child rearing and her feelings of inadequacy at work. And without warning, Mike turned and said, if you don't like the way you feel, then change your feelings. Life's tough, so just handle it, Brenda, okay? Brenda was devastated. She felt she could have expected the rebuff. She should have. It wasn't that easy to express her neediness in the first place especially with Mike's coldness. Now she felt as if he had chopped her feelings into bits. He seemed to have no understanding whatsoever of her feelings, and he didn't want to. Mike does have a responsibility to connect with Brenda, not only as a provider and a parenting partner, but as a loving husband. Connecting emotionally with Brenda is part of loving her as loving himself. Now, he isn't responsible for her emotional well-being, but he is responsible to her. His inability to respond to her needs is a neglect of his responsibility. They are termed non-responsive because their lack of attention to the responsibilities of love. 
That means when you have a need, they just can't say yes. And there's two categories also of that person. Non-responsives fall into two categories, and that is the, there's one kind who is very critical toward others' needs. And the reason why, which I found very interesting, was because they despise need within them own selves. They have need, and they don't like it. They don't like being needy. And so because they despise that in themselves, they don't realize it, but they project that onto someone else who comes to have, and they have a need, and they don't like that need in themselves. They don't like it in you. It's not personal. Can you just see that this is just a broken pattern? And then the other category of non-responsives, people who cannot say yes, are people who are just so absorbed in their own selves that they just can't. They're just too focused on themselves, which is narcissism. And if you've never been in a narcissistic relationship, well, praise God. Now, the last category is called the avoidant. Now, what does that look like? The avoidant is somebody who can't hear yes. So we've got, you can't say no, you can't hear no, you can't say yes, you can't hear yes. What does you can't hear yes look like? The avoidant sets boundaries against receiving care of other people. They have an inability to ask for help, and sometimes they don't even recognize their own need. And when they're in trouble, they withdraw. They won't ask for support. And one thing that I learned about the avoidant is they don't have boundaries. They have walls. And those walls, God never intended. He did intend the boundaries but this person will put up a wall so that if you see a person like this and you know that they're having a difficulty, a struggle, a heartache, a hardship, whatever the case may be, and you reach out to them, you're not getting past that wall. They will not receive your love. Maybe it could be pride, but listen, maybe they just don't know how. Maybe, you know what happens to me sometimes I don't think I manifest that pattern right there, but occasionally I do. But when I do sometimes and I feel that need to reach out, I start thinking, well, I don't want to bother anybody, right? I don't want to, you know, and these kind of thoughts. I mean, you heard this woman's day, the kind of thoughts that go through people's mind. And yet we'll come to church and someone disappoints us in a small way and we don't stop to think what has happened to them during their day. We have no idea the kind of uh, just daily stuff like that. This woman woke up praying, Lord, give me something to hope for. As soon as she opened her eyes and it continued throughout the day and she just kept getting more added and added and added to her. I'm not saying, oh, poor, her, but I'm just saying we all have some issues. And instead of judging one another, like, like I mentioned in the beginning with James 5, 16, um, when we confess our faults one to another, we don't, though. We lie. We keep it hidden. Or if they approach us, we say, no, nothing. you didn't hurt me. You didn't offend me. Well, uh, I see you're struggling. Can I pray? No, everything's fine. When we do that, we quench an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to make a connection, a deep connection that is essential for this body to be impactful in this community. We are like, if you want to imagine, if I'm going to make brownies and I get myself a bowl and I get some flour and some cocoa and some sugar and oil and eggs and I put it into the bowl, that bowl represents this building where we come to gather. The ingredients are us. We come into the bowl and then when the service is over, we come up out of the bowl and we go home. We go home as sugar, cocoa, flour, never having mixed up and never becoming brownies that somebody can enjoy. We have got to start mixing with one another, sharing with one another. Now, I'm not saying that we need to tell everybody all our dirty laundry, but this place, if nowhere else, should be a place that if I need to, I can roll my whole basket of laundry in here and I can say guys I can't 
And somebody will say, you know what? I know how to fix this one. Let me show you what to do. And someone will say, you know what? I don't, I don't know about this one right here, but this one I do. You know, uh, just a few years ago, I had joined um, trying to get fit, right? Joined Planet Fitness a few years ago. One of the uh, things that they have on their wall, it's like a, a motto. It's called the No Judgment Zone for a fitness place. That means if you're this big, you shouldn't get judged. If you're little, you shouldn't get judged. It don't matter. They're saying, not judge. Why? Because you're there to do something about it. So why should you judge them? They're there. They're working. Should not the house of God be that same place instead of going, man, why does he keep struggling with that? Why can't he just get it right? You don't think that guy down there on the floor with his face in the mud's going, God, why can't I get it right? What he might need is somebody to sit down and say, hey, I'm going to sit on the floor with you. I see you're low right now and I'm going to get low with you. We need to learn how to love. One of the things I've had to do is to start recognizing my own deficiencies, inabilities. You know, I I used to think, well, I'm I'm a loving person. Sure, I know how to love. But more and more, God's showing me there's things I just don't know. I don't know how. I want to, but I need somebody to show me. One last thing I want to share I really do encourage this book. I get nothing from this book, by the way. It's not like I get some kind of kickback. I didn't write the book. But I have found so much help for my own personal life. It's worth it. Because it's not just about you. It's about the relationships around you. And it's teaching you how to relate to one another. And how to repair these broken ways of doing things that sometimes we just don't know how to be different. We don't know. So, to leave you with hope, I want to show you what quickly, and this one is shorter. I want to read you briefly, what does a day look like in a life with boundaries? Just to give you the hope that this is worth it for you to invest the time. So a few months have passed. 6 a.m. The alarm sounded. Sherry reached over and turned it off. I bet I can do without this alarm, she thought. I've been awake for five minutes already. Getting seven or eight hours of sleep had long been a fantasy of hers, one in which she thought was unrealistic with a family, yet it had begun to happen. The kids went to bed earlier now, and she and Walt began setting better time limits with them. She and Walt even got a few minutes to relax together before bed. The sleep goal didn't come without its price, however, like the other night when Sherry's mother had once again made her unexpected visit. This time, she showed up at a time when Sherry had to work on a science fair project with her son, Todd. It had been one of the hardest things that Sherry ever had to say. Mom, I want to visit with you, but this is a really bad time. I'm helping Todd with his science fair project, and he needs my full attention. You could come in and watch if you like, or I could call you tomorrow and we could plan a time to get together. Sherry's mother hadn't reacted well. The martyr syndrome had kicked in full force. It's just as I've always known, dear, she said. Who'd want to spend time with a lonely old lady? Well, I'll just go home and be by myself like every other night. At one time, Sherry would have folded under such a masterful uh, onslaught of the guilties. But she had, after lots of practice with her church support group, decided how to handle her mom's unexpected visits. And she didn't feel so guilty anymore. Mom would be fine until the next morning, and Sherry would have a good evening. 6.45 a.m. Sherry slipped into her new dress. It fit perfectly, two sizes smaller than she had worn a few months ago. Thank God for my new self-boundaries, she prayed. Her diet and exercise program were working wonders, not because she learned any new secrets about food or working out, but because she saw taking care of herself not as selfish, but as stewardship. She had stopped feeling guilty about getting, taking time away from other things to work on her body. Getting in shape increased her confidence 
which made her be a better wife and a mother. And she liked herself better. 7.15 a.m. Amy and Todd were finished with breakfast and were taking their plates to the sink to rinse them and place them in the dishwasher. Sharing household tasks had become a comfortable habit for all members of the family. Sure, Walt and the kids had resisted at first, but then Sherry stopped preparing breakfast until she got help cleaning up. A miracle had happened with the kids and Walt. A light had gone on inside. If I don't work, I don't eat. Ever more sat even more satisfying was watching the kids get to their school rides on time with a couple of minutes to spare. Beds made, homework done, lunches packed, incredible. Of course, the path to that place had been rocky. In the beginning, Sherry had called the carpool parents, and she had told them to wait no longer than 60 seconds for her children. And if they didn't show up, leave. When Amy and Todd had missed their ride, they accused Sherry of betraying and humiliating them. You just don't care about our feelings, they shouted. Tough words for a mother who's trying to learn boundaries. Yet with a fervent prayer life and a good support group, Sherry held to her boundaries. After a few days of having to walk and being late to school, the kids had begun setting their own alarms. Hmm. 7.30 a.m. Sherry applied her makeup in the bathroom. She was still not used to this after all those years of applying eyeliner in the car's rearview mirror. But she enjoyed the ease and safety of not having to multitask and drive, and she left for work with a few minutes to spare. 8.45 a.m. Walking into the conference room of McAllister Enterprises, where she worked as Vice President of Human Resources, the promotion had come for leadership effectiveness. Hmm. She glanced at her watch. The meeting was about to start, and she would lead it. Glancing around the room, she noted that three key people were not there yet. She simply made a note and said, I need to connect with them later. Maybe they're having some boundary issues that I can help with. Sherry smiled. She remembered the days not too long ago when she would have been grateful for someone at work to help her with the same problems. Thank you, God, for a church that teaches biblical views of boundaries, she prayed. And then she began the meeting on time. 11.59 p.m. a.m., just before lunch, she, Sherry's extension rang. She picked it up. Sherry Phillips, she said, waiting for the answer. Sherry, thank goodness you're there. I don't know what I'd done if you'd been to lunch. There was no mistaking that voice. It belonged to Lois Thompson. It was unusual, though, for Lois to call these days. She didn't call much at all since Sherry had begun, begun addressing the imbalances in their friendship. She had confronted Lois over coffee. Lois, it seems as if, though, you only want to talk to me when you're hurting and that's fine, but when I'm struggling, you're either unavailable, distracted, or uninterested. Lois had protested that this was not true at all. I'm a true friend, Sherry, she said. Well, I guess we're going to find out, Sherry had told her. I need to know if our friendship is based on what I do for you or on true friendship. And I want you to be aware of some boundaries that I'm setting with us. First, I won't be able to drop everything for you, Lois. I simply can't take that kind of responsibility for your pain. I do love you. And second, there will be times when I'm really struggling, and I'm going to call you, and I'm going to ask for your support. But I actually don't know if you know me and my struggles at all. So I think we both need to find out. Over the next few months, Sherry had found out a great deal about that friendship. She found out that when she couldn't console Lois during her chronic emergencies, Lois would withdraw, hurt. She found out that when Lois was doing all right, she would ignore Sherry. And Lois never called just to see how Sherry was doing. 
And Sherry found out that when she called Lois with problems, Lois could only talk of herself. It was sad to find out that her childhood connection had never really flourished into a mutual attachment. Lois simply couldn't come out of her self-centeredness enough to want to understand Sherry's world. But back to the phone call at present, Sherry answered, Lois, I'm glad you called, but I'm just heading out, heading out the door. Can I call you back later? But I need to talk now, came the sullen response. Lois, I can talk, but if you call back later, here's some better times. They said their goodbyes and hung up. Maybe Lois would call back. Maybe not. More likely, Lois's other friends were all busy. And her name had just been the next one that came up to call. Well, I'm sad that Lois isn't happy with me, Sherry thought to herself. But she's going to have to deal with that because trying to take responsibility for Lois's feelings is trying to own something that God never gave me. With that thought, she went to lunch. 4 p.m. Sherry's afternoon passed fairly uneventfully. She was on her way out of the office when her direct report now, Jeff Moreland, flagged her down. Without stopping her pace, Sherry said to him, Hi, Jeff. Can you leave me a message? I've got to be on the road in 30 seconds. Frustrated, Jeff left to write the message. What a shift the last few months. For Sherry's boss to now be someone who now reported to her wasn't something she expected. Yet when she had begun setting limits in her job and not covering Jeff and his bases, his productivity dropped dramatically. Jeff's irresponsibility and lack of follow-through emerged. His own superiors had, for the first time, become aware that he was the problem. They had discovered that Sherry was the driving force behind the HR department. She was the one who made things happen, while Jeff took most of the credit. Sherry's boundaries had done their job. They had exposed his irresponsibility. They had clarified where the actual hole in the wall was, and Jeff had begun changing. Of course, at first, he had been angry and hurt. He had threatened to leave the company. But finally, things had settled down, and Jeff had actually begun being more responsible and productive. He buckled down. The demotion woke him up and let him see that he'd been riding on the coattails of others. Sherry and Jeff still had their problems. He had a hard time hearing no from her still. And it was difficult for Sherry to deal with the resentment from him over it. But there was no way that she would trade places with her old self, the one with no boundaries. 4.30 p.m. We're almost done. The session with Todd's fourth grade teacher went well. For one thing, her husband Walt had attended with Sherry. Knowing that he was supportive made all the difference. But more important, the hard boundary work that Sherry and Walt were doing at home with Todd was beginning to pay off. Miss Phillips, said the teacher, I'll admit, I took Todd with some reservations after consulting with Miss Russell, his third grade teacher. But there is significant improvement in his ability to respond to limits. Walt and Sherry smiled at each other. Believe me, Walt said, there was no magic formula. Todd hated doing homework, minding us, and taking responsibility for household chores. But consistent praise and consequences seemed to have helped. The teacher agreed. They really have. Not that Todd's a compliant angel. He'll always speak his mind. And I think that's good in a child his age. But there's no major struggle in getting him to behave. It's been a good year so far. Thank you for your support as parents. That meeting went a lot different. 5.15 p.m. As Sherry fought the afternoon rush hour traffic, she felt strangely grateful for the traffic. Why? Well, I can use this time to thank God for my family and friends and plan a fun weekend. 6.30 p.m., Amy walked into the family room right on time. Mother-daughter time, Mom, she said. Come on outside. 
Leaving the house, they started on their pre-dinner walk around the block. It mainly consisted of Sherry's listening to Amy chatter on about school and books and friends, all the things she had yearned to talk about. It hadn't always been that way. After a Christian therapist had seen Amy and the family about her withdrawal, he noticed that Todd's misbehavior had monopolized the family's attention. Amy wasn't a squeaky wheel, so she received less time with Amy and Walt. Gradually, she had withdrawn into herself. There just wasn't anyone in the house to give her what she needed. Her world had become her bedroom. Noting the problem, Sherry and Jeff had made special attempts to make sure that Amy was encouraged to talk about her issues, even if they weren't the crises that her brother Todd was in. Over time, like a flower opening up to the light, Amy began interacting with her parents once again. She was beginning to connect like a normal little girl would. The boundary work that Sherry and Walt did with Todd was part of Amy's healing process too. 7 p.m., Halfway through dinner, Sherry's cell phone rang, but she didn't know it. She had put her phone on silent and left it in another room. When she checked her phone later, she listened to the message. Sherry, this is Phyllis from church. Can you pitch in for the retreat next month? Putting her phone on silent had been the answer to the dinner disruptions. The family's boundary was now phones off and put away through dinner, and the dinner time was richer for it. Sherry made a mental note to call Phyllis later that evening and regretfully decline. She and Walt were having a couple's weekend during those days. It helped to keep them honeymooning. Interestingly enough, when Sherry's boundary work had first began, she started backing off from church commitment. She had to sort out some of these things. Now, however, she was sensing more of a desire to be involved in a couple of the ministries to which she felt called. It's like comforting uh, someone else as I have been comforted, she thought to herself. But she realized that she'd probably never be as available to Phyllis as Phyllis wanted. But that was between Phyllis and God. Sherry was out of that particular loop. 7.45 p.m. The kids and Walt cleared the table without being asked. They didn't want to miss their next meal any more than they had breakfast. 9.30 p.m. The kids were in bed, their homework assignments done, they had even some playtime before bed. Walt and Sherry sat down together with a cup of coffee, and they talked quietly about each other's day. They laughed over the goof-ups and commiserated over the failures, planned the weekend, and talked about the kids. They looked into each other's eyes and were glad to see the other one there. A miracle of miracles and a hard-won miracle Sherry had had to go to therapy herself, along with joining the church support group. It had taken a long time to move out of her strategy of loving Walt from his anger. Her boundaries had needed much practice with safe people before she was ready to confront her husband. And it had been a scary time. Walt hadn't known what to do with a wife who could set limits. A wife who would say to him, just so you know, it hurts me when you criticize me in public. And if you do it again, I will confront you immediately and I will leave and take a cat home. I will not live a lie anymore. And I will protect myself from now on. Here was a wife who would no longer take responsibility for Walt's tantrums and withdrawal who would say, if you won't talk to me about your unhappiness, I'll back off. I'll be with a couple of my friends if you want to talk. This was a difficult adjustment, for Walt was used to Sherry drawing him out, soothing his ruffled feathers, and apologizing for being imperfect. Here was a wife who confronted his emotional distance with 
you're my first choice for intimacy. I love you. And I want to make you first in my heart. But if you won't spend time being close, I'll spend that time in a support group or at church or with my friends or with the kids. But I won't be in the den watching you watch TV anymore. You'll have to watch and pop your own popcorn. He had threatened. He had sulked. He had withdrawn. But Sherry stuck to her guns. With help from God, her friends, her therapist, and her church support group, she withstood Walt's blusterings. He began to experience what it was like not to have her around and underfoot. And he missed her. For the first time, Walt actually experienced his dependency on Sherry. How much he needed her. How much fun she was when she was around. And he began to slowly, gradually fall in love with his wife again. This time, a wife with boundaries. She changed too. Sherry stopped playing the victim with Walt. She found herself blaming him less. She was less resentful. Her boundaries helped her develop a full life that didn't need Walt to be as perfect as she had wished. No, it wasn't an ideal marriage, but it felt more solid now, like an anchor in the storms. They were more like a team with mutual love, mutual responsibility, and they were not afraid of conflict, and they forgave each other's mistakes and respected each other's boundaries. Last entry. 10, 15 p.m., lying in bed, snuggled next to Walt, Sherry reflected over the past several months of boundary work. She felt warm and grateful for the second chance that God had given her. And once again, a passage of scripture came to her mind, one that she had read many times. It was the words of Christ from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. I'll always be poor in spirit, she thought, but my boundaries help me find the time to receive the kingdom of heaven. I will always mourn the losses that I suffer in this life, but setting limits helps me find the comfort that I need from God and others. I'll always be meek and gentle, but being a separate person helps me to take the initiative to inherit the earth. Thanks, God. Thank you for the hope you gave me and for taking me and those I love along your path. Now, that's after her boundary work. So um, this is pretty much it. As you can see, quite a big difference between where we started and where she ended. Um, and for me... I wrestled with how long it was going to take to share this. Um, but every time I tried to move away from it, because I knew how long it would take, the Holy Spirit said no. And I saw how much it was helping me. And not just for me, but I could see it in every relationship I have, different patterns emerging. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that it can be helpful to each and every one of us to make us better, to make us turn, turn us into those brownies where we learn to open up to one another a little bit more share a little bit more, love a little bit more, be merciful a little bit more, confess our faults, pray. Say, I need you to, can you pray with me? I've been dealing with this one on my own. I mean, not be ashamed, not lie to one another, not hide from one another, because it's going to, if we can get that and take that, it's going to increase what we can do, how we impact this community. Um, and that's all I have. <laughs>